Hello, hello, hello. This is your boy and your brother in Christ CD. Just want to share with you a little bit about the video that I'm about to post because it needs an introduction. And so um, just to give a little background on it, a friend of mine sent me um, a video that uh, was entitled the vaccine was the mark of the beast or something, something rather close to that. And, um, and so I remarked and I said in my reply that um, I don't believe that the vaccine is the mark of the beast and uh, I'll be happy to discuss it with you over a Bible study. And so she accepted it. She also invited her friend who has been kind of, you know, teaching her and tutoring her on uh, on his doctrine as well as I'm sure other doctrine as well. He's very well read on the Bible and uh, you can see that as me and him and uh, a friend of mine who's also uh, who I invited dialogue about um, this um, about this and try to come to an understanding of what the Bible is actually saying that the mark of the beast is. Um, I have my own beliefs of what I believe the mark of the beast is and um, uh, and to my belief is very biblical and uh, scripture also lines up with scripture. So those are going to be some of the things that we're going to be discussing. Again, I said, as I said before, I did invite um, a friend of mine. He um, is an ex-pastor and um, he's very um, well versed in the Bible. And so um, I'm actually glad that I invited him because um, in, in the midst of the video recording uh, my audio kept messing up and so there's a lot of the times where i'm trying to talk and you will see me trying to talk and just and and nothing is coming out and so is the discussion is mainly between those two and so um and also he has more of a structured way of going through the bible study whereas i would be all over the place and then it'll make the bible study to take a little bit longer because i know what i'm looking for i just don't always know where to find it and so um with that being said i do hope that you guys enjoy it and if you do please like and share comment as well um and let me know what your thoughts are you know i accept all feedback uh as long as they're respectful i'm also willing to reason with whomever about other subjects as well um now i just want you guys to know that my point of view and my perception will con uh, continuously always come from the bible point of view but um you know i welcome all other points of views as well um it not not saying that i would agree with them but um as my motto goes for reasoning together just because we disagree don't mean we have to be enemies and so we could be of a different opinion we could be of a different belief and yet we could still be friends and what reasoning together is all about is being able to talk about differences and and be able to you know come to a conclusion whether we agree or not you know um but yet still walk away um as friends if any of the viewers uh want to talk you know i'm very open to it so just let me know with your comment or get a hold of me uh by any of my other sources especially if you have my my contact info so if not just comment on the video and uh, i'm usually really good about getting right back to it so uh just let me know god bless you and have a great and blessed week Actually have a couple questions. Okay. Um, my first question is, what do what is you guys uh, what is your guys understanding or, or what is y'all opinion on when the rapture take place? Is it post rap, mid rap, pre rap, pre tribulation? Excellent question. Excellent question. <laughs> but but um. If we if we dive into that, there is a good possibility we'll never get to the mark of the beast. So, <laughs> I mean, if you want, I mean, we I can postpone that for another time, um, for maybe even next week, next uh, Friday. That's that fine. Could... So, so do you want to tackle that question now? Um, I just I'm not even going to respond. I just want to hear the what uh, you guys' opinion of it. Well, okay. So I'll, I'll touch on it, but it could open up a can of worms. <laughs> um, okay, people argue about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. 
And now, you know, it's pre wrapped post, post wrapped that kind of thing. That's not the question. That's not the only question out there. But it's like people have forgotten the question of, is it preterism, historicism, or futurism? So I think that this pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-rap, post-rap discussion, I think it's all a distraction, a decoy, um, rooted in some false theology that started creeping into Protestantism in the 1830s. I'm listening. Yeah, I don't see anywhere in scripture where the second coming is described as being separate from the rapture. Now, the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib question, that all is based on the assumption that the 70th week of Daniel 9 is future. But it makes more sense to keep the 70 weeks together as a single unit. If we throw the 70th week into the future and call it the tribulation and say it has to do with the Antichrist instead of the Christ, we lose the ability to date the first 69 weeks. Now, they've had 180, over 180 years now, I guess, to come up with valid dates for the first 69 weeks if you throw the 70th week into the future and they still haven't been able to do it. So I think we got to keep the 70 weeks together. Now, another issue is, okay, preterism puts the Antichrist in the distant past and says he's going to reign for three and a half literal years, 1260 literal days. And futurism says the Antichrist is a single person in the future who's going to reign, rule for three and a half literal years, 1260 literal days. So futurism and preterism are the same in that regard. They say that it's a literal three and a half years and it's a single person. Those were ideas that were promoted in the Counter-Reformation by Jesuit scholars to try and come up with alternative views on prophecy that would get the Bible off the Pope's back. Protestants in the Reformation, pretty much universally, said that the Antichrist is the papacy, the papal power of Rome, and that the 1260 days are really 1260 years that the Pope would rule during the Dark Ages. I think we, okay, and that, that idea, that's historicism, saying that the Antichrist is a system rather than a single person that would reign for 1260 years, that's historicism. And we really, as Protestants, we ought to get back to historicism and uh, toss futurism out the window because it's, it's a flawed theory. <clears throat> now, I probably opened up some cans of worms with that, all of that. Yeah, huh? I definitely want to uh, put this on the book for next week. Uh... <laughs> I, I'm totally fine with that. Let's go ahead and dive into um, the Mark of the Beast. Okay. And yeah. Let's uh, somebody read Revelation 12, verse 17. That's the verse right 12. before. That's the, the last verse before we start talking about the beast. Revelation the 12, the verse 17? Yeah. Yes. All right, it says, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring and those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Okay. And then he sees the beast come out of the sea and so forth. And then there's a second beast that comes out of the earth. So we got these two beasts. The first one is we could call the Antichrist. The second beast is later called the false prophet. The second beast enforces the mark of the first beast. If you don't have the mark, you're gonna, you can't buy or sell. And if you don't worship the image of the first beast that the second beast has made, then you're gonna be killed. Okay, and then we move into chapter 14. It's got some verses about the 144,000 that are without fault before the throne of God. And then you've got three angels' messages. The third angel, beginning in verse uh, nine. nine. So he warns, don't worship the beast. 
Don't worship his image. Don't receive his mark or you're going to fry. Okay, after that, immediately after that, what does verse 12 say? Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Okay, so 1217 and 1412 both mention the commandments of God. So that tells us that the issue in the end of time having to do with the beast, the image, and the mark, it has something to do with the commandments of God. Can I, can I just make a point real quick? And I don't want to throw things off too much. Um, so I'm reading out of the uh, King James Version. Mine, mine reads just a little bit different. Oh, I, can and, try, I, can, I can put it on there too. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, it's okay. Whatever you're comfortable with. But uh, yeah, I, I wanted to uh, just, just make a note here. Because mine says something a little bit different. And I think that that, 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 that is, is, is significant. What is that? Uh, mine says, um, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So I think that there's a distinct difference in having faith in Jesus than having a faith of Jesus. Okay. So the issue in the end of time has something to do with the commandments. Now, if we back up a little bit to the last verse of chapter 11, John sees in the temple in heaven, the Ark of his Testament or covenant. That would be the Ark of the New Covenant because it's not in the temple on earth, it's in the temple in heaven. Well, the Ark was just a box to hold the tables of the covenant. That's how it got its name, Ark of the Covenant, because it held the tables of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So the implication would be that these commandments of God that 1217 and 1412 are talking about, had it specifically it could be any of the commandments of God, but it should definitely be the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> and it's not hard to see how those are under attack today. Um, okay, let's note three things in chapter 13. Um, one thing that we can note, which everybody's pretty much familiar with, is that uh, in verse 16, the mark of the beast goes in the forehead or in the hand. Now, the seal of God in Revelation 7 that the 144,000 get, and that in chapter 14 is identified as being... Maybe, uh, maybe you might want, because uh, I know Donnell um, might want to, you know, look a little bit more deeper into some of the verses instead of okay. kind of like giving a, a paraphrased version so that uh, we can see exactly what the Bible is saying. You know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, in other words, read verse uh, 16. Yeah, chapter let's do that. 13? Yeah. 13, okay. 16? Yes, please. Are you asking me to? Oh, you can. Oh, I can. It doesn't matter. Go ahead. All right. Uh, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And I believe okay, we're now talking let's about. Let's look at. Um, Revelation 7 and verse 3. <clears throat> this, this is the contrast. You, you, there's two marks in Revelation. You got the seal of God and you got the mark of the beast. Revelation 7 verse 3. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And verse four says, how many are sealed? It's 144,000. Right. Um, it says, okay, go ahead. So, so the seal of God has to go in the forehead, not just the hand. The mark of the beast could go in the hand and not the forehead or go in the forehead and not the hand, but the seal of God must go in the forehead. So that's an interesting little difference there. Okay, uh, back to chapter 13. Um, okay, verse 14. And, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had poor power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them, that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by, that had the wound by a sword and did live. And the next verse too. 
And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So you've got to worship this image or you're going to be killed. So the mark of the beast goes in the forehead or the hand. You've got to worship the image or you're going to be killed. And the third thing we're going to note has to do with worshiping the beast. Um, Verse 12. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now note, it's not just the people that dwell therein that are worshiping the first beast. The earth too is worshiping the first beast. It's the earth and the people that worship. Well, how does the earth worship? Right, we'll get to that. But just note that it's the earth, the land, the ground is worshiping too. It's not just the people. Okay, before we go anywhere else, we'll just take a quick look at uh, the third angel's message of Revelation. Wait, wait, I got something to add. Okay. I see you jumping around to different uh, verses, but it's it's a big verse that you that you're missing out okay. and that's verse 17 okay verse 17 says and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name that's three okay. different marks that Jesus just explained to us that you could have one or the other to be considered the mark of the beast. That's a good point. And confirmation of that is also in Revelation 14. If we go there and we read verse 11, and the smoke of their torment exceeded up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and who will so ever receive it, the mark of his name. That's okay. so it's 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 more than one mark that you could that Jesus is telling us. That's how we've been deceived. Yes, it's a mark, a literal mark that's coming for your hand and your forehead. But Jesus Christ said that is not all. You can receive the 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 uh you can receive the the, the enemy's name and his number, and that could be considered the mark. And you will get the same punishment as you as you would if you worship the beast or receive the other markers coming. So well, you, read you verse think... one of chapter 14. Okay, go ahead. Verse 20. Verse one. And I looked and lo, and stood on the Mount Sion with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their forehead. So the seal of God is somehow linked to the name of God. The mark of the beast is somehow linked to the name of the beast. Exactly. So it's not necessarily saying that there's more than one mark. It's purposely connecting the name with the mark for a reason. So why did, why? Every word means something. Why was it, why is it saying or? Or means other than, something else added on to it. It's just not saying just a mark. It's like it's, uh, you, what, what you're saying is or means there's other options. It's also other things that God is telling us that you can get that can be considered the mark of the beast. And the reason I bring this up is this. I read a lot. I read the Bibles daily, and, and I believe that God shows me a lot of different things. And one of the things he showed me is that one of the enzymes in this vaccine is called luciferase. Luciferase is in the, in the vaccine, and it's named after Lucifer, the light bearer. You can Google that. They've been changing stuff off the internet, but it was. You can Google it at first. So if Luciferase is in the vaccine and it's named after Lucifer, because you can hear a name Lucifer in the name, that God is telling us that that is part of the mark of the beast. It has the enemy's name in it. 
everybody is getting it injected into their body. Well, there's, there is, um, I mean, we're going to look at three different passages that are going to steer us in a different direction. Um, and the passages are going to steer us in a different direction. It won't be human reasoning. It's going to be the passages themselves. And um, I think that the, the, what's going on now with COVID and the vaccine and all and these mandates and the lockdowns and all this stuff, it is leading us toward the mark of the beast, but it's not the mark of the beast. Uh, why, why do you not think so? I well, mean, I, my opinion is this. Before, before the vaccine came out, we had the mask. The mask, you couldn't go into a store unless you have that mask on. Yeah. Which, which symbolize you can't buy or sell without the mask. Right. The vaccine so that's why I'm came, saying it's leading toward the mark of the beast. But okay, it's not the, the mark of the beast. The vaccine came, the mask now, the mask doesn't matter. But now it's the vaccine. Now they making it mandatory for you to go to work. You can't go to work unless you have this vaccine. You can't pretty much do anything. You can't even travel right now to certain countries unless you've been fully vaccinated, both vaccine shots and the booster. And I, I don't know if you ever heard of the quantum dot tattoo. Well, let me ask you this. Who's the beast? Satan. There's two of them though. But that's... That's, Remember we read that part where one beast gives power to another beast? That's not what the Protestant reformer said. Protestant? You a Protestant? Yeah, yeah. I am. Are uh, you a Protestant? That, 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 under, that, that clarifies a lot of things for me. I'm a Christian. I'm not yeah, a you're a Christian too. Well, most Protestants today aren't protesting anymore. But that's what they got the name from was because um, they were protesting well, against the false teaching. You, hold on, hold on one second, Bob. Uh -huh. I think you. I think you're assuming that everybody knows about the Protestant Reformation. And they don't. Well, What's that? Uh, that's part of our problem today. Exactly. But so just, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's what I'm saying. Um, he, when, you, when, when, when he when he said that he's a Christian and we're Protestants, that right there let me know that he's not familiar with it. Okay. So, um, th th so when we go look into history, the Protestant Reformation is something that happened that basically separated um, Papal Rome from people protesting the doctrine or the lack thereof that they were enforcing on people. The more people started reading the Bible, the more they started going away from the, 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 the forced doctrine from the Roman Papal Church. Right. The more they read the Bible, they started. The more they read the Bible, because okay, you heard of, you, have, have you heard of um, um, uh, what do they call it, indulgences? Okay, so that's something that the Catholic Church still practices today. Um, not all of them, but uh, <laughs> but Rome, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, um, indulgences is something that basically they they allow people to give money for sins. Is that biblical? Uh, no, but I, I know what you're talking about. I heard okay. about it. All right. All right. So, I mean, and, and to be honest with you, it's not just the papal church that does this. There's a lot of churches that do this, you know, but it, it, it's, it's, it's something that was started with the pagan, with the papal Roman Catholic church. Okay. Um, and the whole thing is based on some false teachings. If you get rid of those false right. teachings, right. indulgences right. goes away, but that's how they built St. Peter's Cathedral over in Rome was by uh, selling these indulgences. Yeah. And Mark another Luther thing, said, there, there, this are, is there, are, there were a lot of other practices that were, so you heard of Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., but Martin Luther, the person that Martin Luther King Jr. was named after. You heard of him before, right? Mm -hmm. You never heard? Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. so you heard of him, Danielle? Yes. Okay, so you know what he's, he's, he's famous for? No. He's famous for basically starting the Protestant Reformation when he he was a priest of Rome. He started reading the Bible for himself and, and he started seeing that a lot of the things that they were forcing and, and on people to do and practicing um, was wrong, was totally against God's word. And so he went to the uh, cathedral at, um, is it, is, is it Worms or somewhere? In and Whitford. he nailed 95 
theses or not rules, but uh, mis misconducts that the Roman church was missing out on and uh, enforcing on people. It wasn't biblical. 95, 95 reasons why indulgences is a false teaching. It, yeah, as well as a lot of other things that they were enforcing on people. And so, and you can look this up, encyclopedia, you, uh, um, Google or whatever the case, look up Martin Luther. And, uh, and, that, and that is what started the Protestant Reformation. That, and, and, and what they what it, what, it, what a Protestant is it's a Christian, it's a Christian who protests the teachings of Rome. So that's why he said that we're Protestants, that uh, you know we're we're biblical Christians, not traditional. Tra a lot of traditions come from Rome. Yeah, no, they, they practice they, they, today. After the after they they tried to destroy the Christians back in the evil days. Yeah, and, yeah, you and, know about and that. And because yeah. and cause, because they couldn't do it, they took the they the Babylonian re religion and indoctrinated it into Christianity and created the um the Catholic Church, but they also tainted tainted the way of Christians just worshiping God at the same time. That is true. That is true. Um I mean, I think that I I think they already had the doctrine of of Babylon mixed in with pagan Rome. But pagan Rome became paper, uh, paper Rome in the time of Constantine in the year exactly. 1313. Yeah. You know, and 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 he converted to Christianity from his pagan beliefs, and so he converted to Christianity. At that time, the Christians were being slaughtered by multitudes. Mm -hmm. But and people was lining up to get martyred. They and they couldn't understand yeah. it. They were yeah, afraid. You're right. You're, you're totally right. But when Constantine came into power and he baptized his army and he won that war, he then converted to, and I say converted because of the stuff that he did even after he was a Christian, pretty much lets you know that he wasn't really converted to Christian. And one of those things was he allowed other pagan beliefs to come in to the Christian church, including the conversion from, from Saturday Sabbath to Sunday Sabbath. That 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 comes from the Roman Catholic Church. I along know. With, along, yeah. Okay. So along with the beliefs of of um, giving authority to the priests. Yeah, I'm saying that. Man. That's in the Bible, though. That's in the Book of Daniel. He said that that was gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So that's when. So when Bob says that we're Protestants, that's what he means. It, it, it's not that we're not Christians. It, it, in fact, we are Christians unapologetically, you know, but we, we follow the doctrine of the Bible, not tradition. Now, I follow the doctrine of the Bible. Like I said, I read the, the, the Bible on a regular basis. I don't, I don't go to church here because that's all they got is Sunday service. And, and God said that his Sabbath was a seal between him and his people. Amen. Uh -huh. He did say that. He did. Okay. okay. Let me and jump the gun. Let me jump the gun. Okay, if the Sabbath is the seal, what would the mark be? I know what you're trying to say. You're trying to say Sunday is the mark. <laughs> what did the I mark come from? To say. But I that's what, what Rome say. says. There and are now, Catholic, look, uh, yeah, Catholic I, I writers. Got, I actually got that video with the Pope Francis confessing that Sunday is the mark of the beast. I, I have that video. Oh, oh wow. But, but the number one, you what, what we me. telling... What we found to realize is this. These people are doing the work of the enemy. The enemy's whole mission is the trick, deceive and to trick. So if that's the case, then you go to the word and we'll see what does the word say. The word right. says that it's a possibility that Sunday could be the mark of the beast. But if that's the case, uh, nobody would be saved because there's so many people that actually go to church. I used to go to church on a Sunday. I did too. I did too. But the thing is, Christ also says that he have he have uh, many sheep in different folds. True. Right. So the mark of the beast, uh, God doesn't God doesn't hold us responsible for what we don't know. That's what make that's where grace comes in. At that's a big part of grace. But he does. He, he only said holds my us. People, he only people holds us responsible for lack of knowledge. He only yeah. He only he only holds us responsible for what we know. For what the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts of. I disagree with that. Because okay. what it says in Romans. What it says Where? in Romans. 
Where? Romans chapter one. Okay, yeah. Well, I, okay, I, I, so where, where does it say that anybody's ignorant of what they're doing? It doesn't say that. It says right. that they are they are without excuse, saying that they don't know because one, he put us here to he put his book here to read. We chose to do other things instead of worship his word like he chose to. So we can't be that ain't gonna be no excuse for us uh, uh, for whatever punishment that we receive because that's what we supposed to do. And not nine, nine times out of ten, ten times out of ten. Just like God has came to us, he has came to every last person on this earth, but they chose to reject him. They chose to push away. They chose to not pick up the Bible and read it and, and, and study his word. This is a choice. So they can't mm -hmm. say, oh, Lord, that I didn't know, because then that's when God, I guarantee he will come to him and say, you remember this day when this person, I sent this person to you to, to, to tell you and you rejected me? You remember this day? I, I didn't been through it a few times before I got saved. So I know for a fact. So, so okay. So when, I, when I express it, I say that if we don't know and didn't have opportunity to know, and mm -hmm. that rules yeah. out the folk that choose not to know. Don't tell yeah. me. I mean, that's I not going to get you off the hook. Right. It, it, so what the Bible says that he winks at our ignorance, what, what, is that, what does that necessarily mean to you? Where does that say that in the verse? Because I have to read. I just can't That's take that book, verse. You read with the context, right? Yeah, you have to read what it says before that and what it says after that. So what, what verse is that? That's in the book of Acts when Paul's on Mars Hill and he tells yeah. the Athenians uh, the times of this ignorance God winked at. That's in Acts 17, verse 30. Yep, 17. And you can read it in context and you can see that it has everything to do with the light that was given to them. Acts 17.30, did you say? Yeah, 17.30. 17.30. Okay. And this is talking about idolatry. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. And that's the situation we got today. The times of this ignorance, God winked at regarding the Sabbath, but now he's commanding all men everywhere to repent. Should we get back to the mark of the beast? I think he's still reading. I, I, he yeah, I'm still reading. He wants oh, some yeah. content. But he he's not really saying which time is he talking about. The times of ignorance God overlooked. What times? Well, he's on Mars here, Hill. So he's he's talking to the yeah, Athenians. Okay, they served other gods. Don't. So you go to twenty nine. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices. Those were the things that they were worshiping. And so verse 30, he, he concludes that in, in, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. You, you said words, this yourself. Bowing down to images. You said this yourself. The Great Commission is for us, God's Christians, to go out and tell them, like what Paul's doing here on Mars, Mars Hill, to, you, to tell the world to repent and be baptized and serve the Lord. That's where we're, our lives are written epistles, uh, and, and we're out here preaching a sermon with the way that we live our lives and how we interact with people, and not just that, witnessing of Jesus, for one, coming back, and for two, uh, you know that he's the savior of your souls, right? And mm -hmm. and and this is how you get the pe the world around us to start repenting, so that they won't be ignorant. And, and and you know, but I believe, you know, contrary to what you believe, that I mean, if somebody is sinning, yeah, you know, that's one thing. But acts you you, you talk about Romans one, but when we go to Romans two, it talks about uh, people who have not heard the gospel that's going to be in heaven. Are you familiar with that? No. Okay. He says basically that their consciousness are a law unto themselves. Yeah, that's true. Right. So it doesn't God, mean God, that they didn't they didn't have the opportunity to receive the word. Well, he I, said I, I, he but, said yeah. that that they consciousness were proved to you because they the law was written on their hearts. But right. that doesn't. Right. 
so, what so, it says so, that before the end come, the word will be preached all over. That's then true. the end will come. That's true. That's true. What about what about those who perish before the end come, the ultimate end come? I'm pretty sure God didn't figure that out. I agree. <laughs> I totally agree. So, so you believe that all those people who have not reached, have not heard the gospel message, or and that's people in America that hasn't. Why? Because we're not doing our job usually. But I mean, there I just are people... think we're in danger of not getting done with the mark of the beast tonight. Uh -huh. Good point. All right, so let's go. Let's go back to that. Let's uh, let's get back. Okay, to the let's point read Re Revelation fourteen nine. So the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, I just want to stress there's the three things there. Don't worship the beast. Don't worship his image. Don't receive his mark. And I see verse 11 as reinforcing that. You know, those so, that time out. The so time out. So you take that verse. And you actually see three things right there, but you don't see the, the three three things in the last verse in Revelation 13. I understand that they both saying similar same thing. They saying or and using the same two words that indicates that it's more than one thing. I um <clears throat> I see it a little different, but I could use a little more study. I don't have a Greek. Um, well, I, I guess I do in my my um, on my uh, computerized Bible. Um, I could look at the Greek text, but I, I seem to remember that there is a difference in one of these verses that that talks about this in Revelation. There is a difference between the Greek manuscripts uh, and how it reads. And, and, and which word are we looking? Which word are I, we talking about here? I, or? I'm not up to speed on that. I can okay. be ready to talk about that next week. Um, okay. But I'm not up to speed on. Let's on make let's make a note about point. that for next week then. So we'll make a note about that for next week. Okay, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter six. We have the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Moses repeats them in Deuteronomy 5 before he dies. And then we've got Deuteronomy 6. Okay, verses 6 through 8. Who wants to read those? And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Okay. So, the Ten Commandments, the commandments of God. Okay, we already saw from Revelation 12, 17 and 14, 12, that the issue in the end of time should have something to do with the commandments. The mark of the beast goes in the forehead or the hand. That's an allusion to... Verse 8 here, the Ten Commandments, God's law, should go in our foreheads and in our hands. We should know his law, we should love his law, and we should do it. Okay, so you apply that kind of idea to the mark of the beast. The reason why it's or, forehead or the hand, the beast doesn't care whether you think he's right or not. Those that think it's right will have it in their forehead. Those that don't think it's right, but they go along with it anyway, so they can continue to eat and they don't lose their life, they'll get it in their hand. <clears throat> now, can the I Jews say took this literal, and they walked around with phylacteries, and they'd make the phylacteries as big as they could. I guess at some point, if you make it too big, you're going to have a hard time walking because you're going to have a hard time seeing. Um, and somebody was just them somebody was, about somebody that. was just talking, asking, could they say something? Okay. Who was that? Oh, that's me. Uh -huh. Um, I think the reason why the Bible stretches 
about the forehead, it's that's where we think and make um, conscious decisions. And, and that's, I, I think that's why the beast wants to take over our minds. So once he has that intact, then, intact. Um, everything will go awire. And that's why the Lord is advising us to fortify our minds so that when that time comes, we will make conscious decisions. Also, when it stays our hands, that's what we have to work with. So when we think positively on things of Christ, then automatically our hands will do the things that God wants us to do. Thank you very much. We're coming down to a point in time where we're going to have to make a choice between the commandments of God, the commandments of the one who gave his life for us, and the commandments of somebody who claims to be God and who claims to be sweet Christ on earth. You know, there, there's, I found four different places on the Vatican's website where they refer to the Pope as being sweet Christ on earth. But that's what we're coming down to. Okay, now let's go over to Daniel chapter 3. Mm, wow. Uh, to just finish that thought about the phylacteries, the Jews took it literal. God didn't mean for what we just read in Deuteronomy 6 to be taken literal, where we literally walk around with God's commandments written on our foreheads or on our hands. So in the end of time, it, you know, it's not going to be literal. We're not going to walk around literally with the seal of God or the mark of the beast in our forehead, or in the case of the mark of the beast in our hand. But in, in Daniel 3, you've got an image that must be worshipped or else you're going to be killed. You're going to be thrown into a furnace of fire. Now, in Revelation 14, God says, if you do worship the image, I'm not going to throw you into a furnace of fire. I'm going to throw you into a lake of fire. And you can take your pick. But there's definitely, I mean, the fact that you've got a fiery furnace here and you've got a lake of fire in Revelation 14, I think there, there's, a, there's an intended parallel between this story and, uh, and the prophecy in Revelation. Now, in verse 2, Nebuch oh, well, verse 1, the golden image, it's 60 cubits by 6 cubits. And that kind of rings a bell, 660 and 6 from Revelation. Verse 2. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together into the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So you've got representatives of like seemingly like the whole world gathered here and it is a global issue in revelation 13 and 14 it's going to involve the whole world verse 4 then a herald cried out to you it is commanded O people's nations and languages so we have a decree here a law and that's what we're going to have in the end of time regarding the mark of the beast and worshiping the image and worshiping the beast that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Now, if you fall down the day er a day early or a day late, you're going to die. But you got to fall down when the king says, when the music plays. This is an enforcement of a particular time of worship. Verse 6, whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So in verse 7, we've got to emphasize a second time. It's an enforcement of a particular time of worship. Now, there was uh, some folk, three folk, that didn't bow down. And some folk ratted on them because they didn't like them. And they used this to get at them. 
and they said in, in such a way that it made Nebuchadnezzar furious. Now, what uh, archaeologists or historians tell us is that um, Nebuchadnezzar just recently had an attempted coup in his army. And so this is kind of like a loyalty oath to him. There's a political element in this. There may be a political element in the end of time with the Mark of the Beast. And so these guys saying, well, there's certain men that you've appointed that you put in. No wonder you're having trouble in your government uh, when you put people like this in charge. Um, there's kind of that kind of element. But Nebuchadnezzar was furious. And uh, verse 13, he commands Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to come before him. Verse 14, well, these guys are the most loyal people in his government. Besides Daniel, uh, how can he put them to death? But he's got to save face. And so he gives them another chance. Verse 15, now, if ye be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Well, before, before the story is over, he found out what God would deliver them. But th verse 15 is the third time in this chapter that it emphasizes that this is an enforcement, a legal enforcement of a particular time of worship. So the issue in the end of time should have something to do with the Ten Commandments. And it should have something to do with a legislated time of worship. Why do you come to that conclusion? Because you, 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 you saying because of what happened in previous times that that's what should happen in the end time. Well, the Book of Revelation is a book of symbols taken from other parts of the Bible, and if we go to these other parts of the Bible where those symbols are taken from, we can find out more what Revelation is trying to say, just like we did with uh, Deuteronomy six. But the reason we did that for Deuteronomy 6, because Deuteronomy 6 was a word from God and word that, the word of God never changed. It's just, a, it's a word that carries on all the way to the end because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it's not the same when it comes to the enemy. He uses different tricks. And the problem that I'm that I'm having is that Nothing that you, you were explaining to me about the mark of the beast is actual words from the, the, the Bible itself saying, this is this, this is this. To me, it seems like the words you are saying is just contradicting the things that the Bible is actually explaining to us. I don't think I've contradicted anything. You basically, now, you saying, now when we saying, you give another convince, example, to give okay. another example from Revelation of a story. So in chapter two of Revelation, you've got Balaam, those that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, the cast in stumbling block before Israel. You've also got that woman Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophetess, and then she's teaching God's servants to commit fornication, eat things, sacrifice to idols. Well, what is that supposed to be talking about? If we go back to those stories in the Old Testament about Balaam and Balak, and about Jezebel, and we look at those stories, then, you know, there's certain elements of those stories that we can then uh, match up to the past or present or future. And, uh, and we can nail down for sure what those prophecies are talking about. Yeah, I understand that. But what I'm saying is this. So you you saying that you you convincing, trying to convince us that Sunday is the mark, going to be considered the mark of the beast because it's a sign of worship because... Uh, in Re Deuteronomy 6, God said that his seal on the forehead was his, was his commandments. So well, you let me put it this that way. because... Let me put it this way. I'm open to whatever scenario you can present. And I've, I've brought this up to other folk. Um, so we're going to look at, okay, the three things, worship the beast, worship the image, receiving the mark. We've looked at two now. We'll look at one more passage and... Uh, if you can find something that fits these three things, other than Sunday being the mark of the beast, I'm open to hearing it. Okay. 
So the, the last passage is Leviticus 25. And I didn't come up with this. I found it in two. One was a periodical article. Another was the appendix of a book. Yeah, in both cases, that came from the 19th century. And it was like, wow, you know, that was kind of interesting. Um, okay, Leviticus 25. Verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. So every seventh year. And I think there's a verse says something about that the land so that the land may keep a Sabbath as well as thou. Anybody see where that's at? Uh, I think verse two is adequate, but I think I think let me just see if I can find it. No, I'm not must not be remembering correctly. But anyway, in these two sources that I found from the uh, 1800s, they pointed the one at least one of them pointed out that this is the only act of worship ever mentioned in the Bible that the land, the ground, the earth participates in is the sabbatical years. Um, so, and, and see, uh, Revelation 13 said that that second beast makes causes the earth and those that dwell therein, the earth and the people, to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. The only act of worship in the Bible is this, that the earth does participate in is the sabbatical years. So you put the three things together. The issue in the end of time should have something to do with the commandments of God, something to do with the Ten Commandments, should have something to do with a legislated time of worship, and should have something to do with a Sabbath of some sort. Okay. See, I, I feel like, and this is my opinion, I feel like after all what you just read, you, and you just said it out your own mouth, you said that because of these things, the the worst it should be, it should be like that in the end time. That that's a, when you say something like that, that means it's your opinion. You feel like it should be something to do with worship in the end times. And when the no, problem the Bible with that says is, that. Do, do you Bible guys can that. you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. Because I was talking a few times and like I just kept getting over talked or I'm like I was wondering if my mic had you know, disconnected or whatever the case. So um when we when we backtrack just a little bit, you you said that the beast was the devil, right? So when we go back to um Revelation um I believe it was twelve when he spoke about eh, is there an echo? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I hear it too. One second. It's not too bad. One second. One second. I'm sorry, guys. Give me one second. Well, I think I know where you're going. That In Revelation 12, the dragon is identified as the devil. Okay, in Revelation 13, that first beast is said to be given its throne, its power, and great authority by the dragon. So that would mean that the beast is not Satan. If the dragon is Satan and the dragon gives the beast its power, its seat, and great authority, the power, seat, and great authority, then um, that beast in Revelation 13, that first beast in verses 1 to 10 is not Satan. It's some power okay. enabled the by beast, Satan. The beast, the beast is Satan in the flesh. He is the what what was what's some of the names they call him? Son of Prediction. Um he, he got several different names. Revelation 13, like, 2. Revelation 13, 2. The dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. Okay. So Satan let's, gives let's, let's go there. I want to show you something else in Revelation 13, 2. 
I mean, 13. And right there, it says, uh, okay, in verse five. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. The, the beast wasn't considered, notice when he said the devil, or he mentioned the devil, he said he, but when he mentioned the beast, he said it. Why? That's, that is it a is a thing. It is not a person. He said it several different times. It. And in verse 5, it mouth. says him in my Bible. And which, which Bible you have? King James. Okay, let me go to the King James. I got the English Standard ESV version. I think, I think it's good to see what the Bible considers beast first before we go forward. Well, one thing that I think can be helpful is noting how in verse 2, it says the dragon gave him his power and his seat. Now, the United States sends an ambassador to the Vatican. And the Vatican, but not really to the Vatican. It, what it's called is the Holy See. The Holy See. Okay? Now, the word see, surprisingly, means seat. I think maybe the CIA World Factbook may even explain that online. Somewhere recently. I saw yeah, I read some, about that. The sea symbolizes Rome. The earth symbolizes the United States. Okay, so seat. I mean, that's... And so seat, that's referring to the, the sea of a bishop. That's his seat. That's his city where he's been assigned to. And so that's referring to the city of Rome. The Pope is the bishop of Rome. And who gave him that? Um, the dragon is primarily Satan, secondarily pagan Rome. Satan through pagan Rome gave the city of Rome to the Pope, and that's his seat. He does have a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. True. Jesus was accused of blasphemy when he claimed to forgive sins, when he claimed to be God, and the Pope does both those things. Yeah, I believe I, that I used the to be Pope... Roman Catholic and I used to go to the priest and confess my sins and the priest would say that my sins were forgiven. Yeah, I know. I, I believe that the, the the Pope is the uh the false prophet, the one that yeah. makes fire rain down from heaven to make everybody worship the first beast. The Antichrist hasn't came yet, but I really believe after reading the scriptures, I really believe that the vaccine is part of the mark of the beast. Who would be who you think the lamb is that speaks as a dragon? Huh? Who is the lamb that speaks as a dragon? I think that's the United States. I do think. Are you sure that that's not the beast who gives his power over to the? Okay. I thought about it at first because if you think about it, right, the Washington D.C., the White House, they got they shut they image is directly a reflection of the one that they send Rome that the Pope has. The it's identical like, image. I yeah, thought so the, we're on I, the same page. Yeah, we're on the same page then. That's my yeah, I, I seen I read and seen all that. But this my uh, the only thing that 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 kind of like that I felt like God was putting on my heart is, is that these are things that we are putting together in our mind because, and not taking what the word actually is telling us. When God is actually telling us, what's what? He, like you said, it's some things in there that, that like the sea and the earth and stuff like that. That Yeah, that's, the, that's describing a place. But uh, other things is describing other things too, like the mark of the beast. We 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 already established that the image, like he did in, in uh, Nebuchadnezzar, described the image that they're gonna worship. They already I got where are you where are you at in uh what country are you at you in the United States or yeah I'm in the country yeah, in you. Minnesota yeah I'm, uh, in, I'm in Wisconsin oh uh, okay uh yeah I know that y'all seen the statue that they saying that they finna build at the end of the year. The twenty foot statue, or was it a ten foot statue? I know y'all. It's called the giant. 
where it can make a face of anybody that you, they see fit. You can walk up to the statue and it scans you and you turn into the big statue. It moves, it talks, it does everything. They said before the end of the, uh, the next year, it's gonna be into 20 states in the United States. I believe that that's the statue that they talked about in the Bible that's gonna be worse. Also- well, here's, here's something, here's something. You know, the, the popes, not just this one, have wanted, they want a new world order. And they want to be the moral authority in the new world order. Now, Revelation 13 says the beast would have a deadly wound and his wound would be healed. Well, he'd like that wound to be healed. He'd like to have the same power he used to have during the dark ages. He'd like to be able to control the conscience of man. Okay, if we get down to the point where a law that has no basis in the Bible and is only based on his authority, if, if that is passed, and the world goes along with this law based on the Pope's authority rather than in contradiction to something God has commanded in the scriptures, then he is back in charge and on top of the world. He's the moral authority in the new world order. Now, is there any indication that that's on his radar and that's his agenda? There is. There's a lot of evidence for that. Yeah, before Pope Francis came to the U.S., he issued an encyclical on climate change. Laudato C. Yes. Laudato C. And he put the little girl in, in charge of it. Her name is Greta Thunberg. And he put into Laudato C. that we ought to keep Sunday. What's that have to do with climate change? Exactly. You're right. It does and say that. And that's not the only example. Okay, John Paul II when he issued a new, uh, a new um, catechism. In that catechism, he calls for the members of the church to work toward legal recognition of, of Sunday. And how do you do that? By, by having Sunday laws, by uniting church and state and compelling the conscience regarding Sunday. Um, you know, in the 2016 presidential elect, uh, campaign, they had a special meeting over at the Vatican, and, um, and uh, Bernie Sanders was invited to speak there as a guest speaker. He wasn't the only guest speaker, but he was one of them. Hillary Clinton didn't get invited. Donald Trump didn't get invited. The only one that got invited was Bernie Sanders. I heard about that beforehand. And so I kind of thought that was kind of odd. But after he spoke, then I heard what the event was. And it's like, what, really? It was for uh, the 25th anniversary of an encyclical that John Paul II uh, had issued called Centissimus Annus. And I knew something about Centissimus Annus, and that's why I said, what, really? Um, Centissimus Annus was an encyclical issued on the 100th anniversary of another encyclical, which is the most blatant one. I mean, John Paul dealt with Sunday, Sunday rest, but the one 100 years before, uh, that was more blatant, talking about how the common man, the working man, they need to be urged and led to keep Sunday to rest on, not just rest, but to worship. So it is on the agenda of the papacy to enforce Sunday. And when they do, when they do reach that objective, the wound will be healed. They will be the moral voice, the moral authority in the new world order, just like they want. Another thing about Sunday law is in many states, it's already there about um, Sunday Blue Laws, including Minnesota. Um, and basically, all, all it takes is just an enforcement. So um, that's another thing that people can start looking into. A lot of states, especially in the Bible, but I'm guessing you in the South, I can tell by your accent. Am I right? Oh. Yeah. I'm in Minnesota. Are you in Minnesota? <laughs> Where are you from? Chicago. Really? Why you got that? Huh. Well, you saw you I, was, I, I was down in I was down in Mississippi for a couple of years. <laughs> well, hey, it's still on you, bro. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you already know about minute. How long you lived in Minnesota? Since uh, ninety three. Okay, so you were there before they they uh, opened the uh, liquor stores on Sunday, right? So you yeah, I was that. here before that. 
Yeah. Well, he's yeah. out to the drive to Wisconsin to uh, get liquor. Yep. So, I mean, there, there are a lot of other places just like that that still shut down liquor stores and other kind of businesses on Sunday because of the day of the Lord, so to speak. You know? So, it, it's already on the books in a lot of states. Have you heard of the uh, the quantum dot tattoo? It's this, it's this. Notice that when the pandemic started, who who they had in charge of it? Bill Gates. He was a front man saying he was the one that said the pandemic was coming. He was in. He was the one saying if if uh until the vaccine is is taken, then the nothing's going to open up. He was like the front man behind everything. So I, I felt like God was putting it on my heart to ask this question. Why would they take a man that specializes in computers and put him in charge of a vaccine? And oh, yeah. it, it just, it was a baffling to me, right? But then all of a sudden, I, God showed me something. It's this thing called this quantum dot tattoo that Bill Gates been working on. It's an invisible ink for your hand or your forehead that, that shows that you've been vaccinated. What does that sound like? Don't that sound like a mark? It goes on your hand or your forehead. It's invisible. You can't see it. They can scan it, and it shows that you've been vaccinated. So I'm like, okay. So that might be considered the mark, but then God started opening up my eyes to different things, saying you can receive the mark or his name or his number. So I know that the, the, the quantum dot tattoo could be considered the mark, one of many, because what y'all saying is also, it's a possibility that that could be accurate also. So if this, put the two together. If what y'all saying is considered the mark, and also this quantum dot two tattoo could be considered the mark, and then the vaccine has Lucifer name in it, that could be considered the mark. So instead of just warning about one particular thing, it's countless things we should be warning people about. Hey, and I, hey, I get what you're saying. The thing is, I don't necessarily disagree with you, but there's one seal of God which you admitted to that was was the seal of God to, to between him and his people before, right? And what seal was that? The Sunday Saturday. It's, huh? The Saturday Sabbath. Yeah, the seventh day Sabbath. Right. So the devil is a great deceiver, and, and part of his deceptions is is that he makes things look so much like like what God does. So he's uh he's what you would call a counterfeit, right? True. Right. So if God has an ultimate seal, what do you think that Luce, uh, Satan also has an ultimate seal? Now all those things can 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 be a part of it or it can usher it in, but there's one thing that is more ultimate than anything, than any of those things. You know, if God has an ultimate seal, then the devil is gonna have his own. I in understand Revelation um, 14 12, <clears throat> it ends the third angel's message after talking about if you worship these through his image or receive his mark, you're going to pry. It ends by saying, Here's the patience of the saints here, they that keep the commandments of God. It's got to have something to do with the commandments. It also has to have something to do with worship. The first angel calls for the world to worship the creator, worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. And the uh, third angel warns us against worshiping the beast or his image. So the issue in the end of time has to have something to do with the commandments and has to have something to do with worship. But that's an opinion, though. But no, if you, it's if what you the say, word says. It's I'm not telling opinion. you, but listen, if you, what the word says, okay, what does it say is in Matthew 24? Matthew 24 in verse. Hold on. Okay. Uh, 37. 24, verse 7? Yeah, Matthew 24, 37. Right. It says, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, after reading that, basically, and this is word from Jesus. 
because the disciples came to Jesus and said, tell us what is the signs of the end time of you coming and the signs of the end. Jesus Christ said, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So I'm reading that, you like, okay, God is directing us to the days of Noah. So after reading that, you go to Genesis 6 to the days of Noah. Yeah. And you go there, it says, instantly when you read it, it says, man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took to them as their wives as they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Now, after reading that, you start thinking, okay, if an angel have a baby with a human, the baby's coming out half angel, half human. That ain't what God created. It's a hybrid. It's not what God created. So that means the DNA was altered. They didn't, they didn't have the DNA that God created. I didn't, and that I didn't. is the reason... That's the reason for the flood. It wasn't just because of sin, because God is merciful and he's, and he's full of grace. It was because their DNA was altered. It said that, if you keep reading down, it said, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of their thoughts was evil and continual and the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth. So the Lord said, I will blot the man out who have created the face of the land, the animals and creepy things. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord, not because he wasn't a sinner like the rest. He found favor because his DNA wasn't altered. He was, he was the creation of Christ. He, he was the way Christ, Christ, where God created him from day one. And Jesus told us, just like in the days of Noah, it would be the same days, same things going on when he returned. So you can't overlook this fact. This is words from Christ himself. Okay, so I'd like to agree with you and disagree with you simultaneously. In verse 12 of Genesis 6, where it says, All flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. I believe that's talking about a corruption of the DNA through genetic engineering that affected all flesh, affected the animals. Okay. How? But when it says, that um, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. It doesn't say there that it's angels mating with people. A lot of it people does. think that. It says the sons of God. The sons yeah, of God. It says the sons angels. of God. And yeah. and if you if you look at First um, John, First John is uh, kind of you know uses some of this language. Absolutely. The sons of God aren't angels in First John, and yeah. and in the previous chapter. It said that uh, in the days of somebody that uh, then men began to call the, upon the name of the Lord. Well, one possible translation there is that then men began to call themselves by the name of the Lord. They became, began to call themselves the sons of God. So this is intermarriage between the descendants of Seth and the descendants of Cain, which is a no-no. You're not supposed to marry unbelievers. And they did. So basically, you saying that the Nephilim, that angels did the fallen angels, wasn't having sex with human women and having babies. No, by. I believe what Jesus says that the angels neither marry nor given are given in marriage. Yes, the real angels, but the fallen angels were. Different. I don't think it's possible, based Why? on what Jesus said. I don't think it's possible for angels to procreate. They haven't been given that kind of uh, capability. What? Based on what Jesus said. But I know it's Jesus common. It's been common since before the time of Jesus. The book of Enoch talks about this. Oh, that the, book, you that's a book that you're not even supposed to read because it's not in the Bible. So you can't well, even bring that in the into the conversation because it's not of God. Well, book that is, book, that book is where this idea came from, as far as I know. It's right here in the word of God. The word it's of God said, doesn't say that angels mated with people. It says the sons of God married the daughters of men. It doesn't say that angels mated with people. That's an interpretation. What, that's what is not found in the Bible? Say that, uh, but everything that you just said was interpretation. You said that the Sunday, uh, the Sunday worship, that's an interpretation. That ain't what the Bible says either. Everything that you were saying 
you were saying an interpretation of. So you can't pick and choose what you can interpret it and, and pick and choose what you can't. Either you're going to interpret support. it or you're not. I did support. I did I support mean, just, from the just... scriptures. I did support from the scriptures by showing those three passages that the, the end time issue has something to do with the commandments of God, something to do with a legislative time of worship, something to do with a Sabbath of some sort. And I'm open to another idea. If somebody says, oh, no, it's not a Sunday law, it's something else. I'm open to hearing somebody else's idea that can fit those three points. But as far as, okay, we've got a different, there's two different possible ideas regarding this, that it's angels mating with people or that it's the descendants of Seth intermarrying with the descendants of Cain. Those are two possible ideas. I'm just pointing out that because the, the scripture itself, doesn't say that either. Well, well, let's go to Luke. Let's the go to scripture Luke. doesn't say that the sons of self were uh, sleeping with. It don't say none of that. Let's go to Luke chapter. Yeah, I, I did. I gave you the verse for that. Let's go uh, to Luke chapter five. Let the Bible speak. Or maybe it's chapter four. Let's see. Which one? This is the lineage of Jesus. Luke what? what? What's the book? Luke chapter 3, verse 38. <clears throat> so they're going from Jesus, from basically the father of Mary, from the, for, uh, which identified Jesus as the son of David, but not just the son of David, but also, if you would look all the way, so this is clear, you got to read all the names, right? Because we both know this, right? Do you want to... You want to start it says up? the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So what does that tell you? Who's the son of God? The son God? of God is Jesus Christ. Is that what is that what is that what that just said? <laughs> it says son of God is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Yeah, All that verse says that Christ, um, that verse Man. says that Adam was the son of God. No, it does not. It says the son of Adam, the son of God. That means Adam was created after Jesus Christ. Oh, what person are you reading again? Huh? It says that Adam is the son of God. What version are you reading again? ESV. Okay, so yeah, because mine, mine read a little bit different. Again, you know, those, 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 distinct, um, some, uh, those distinct differences, that I think that kind of means something. Because mine says which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. It didn't just say Adam, son of God. It said, which was, you know what I mean? And so with that being said that, yeah, Jesus was the son of God, but he was, he didn't come incarnate at that time yet. Right? Huh? So He's the yeah. only begotten son of God. But According here, everyone from the lineage of Adam to Seth and on down, apart from Cain, are sons of God. Does that make sense? It, 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 it's telling me that every, I don't understand. I don't, it just sounds like everything is contradictory. And God don't give us a spirit of confusion. Contradictory. If you want, if you want, we can go start at 24 so you can know that this is the lineage of Jesus. I've read that before. Okay. I read that. So we're talking about all the son, all you know, starting with Mary's father on down, basically to Adam, who was the son of God. So so you saying you saying that the sons of God was the lineage of Adam sleeping yes. with the daughters of men, which was the lineage of Cain. Cain. Yes. Because 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 uh, according to the word of God, who who was who did Cain follow? Okay. So if that's did, the case, explain uh, verse three in Genesis six. I want to hear your interpretation of Genesis six verse three in the Genesis King James version. Genesis 6, 3. Okay. Give me a sec. So Noah preached for 120 years and then the flood came. True. 
and the Holy Spirit was not always going to be striving with man, trying to reach The Holy man. Spirit wasn't given then. Well, the Holy Spirit existed. Oh, it wasn't <laughs> given to man then. When was the it Holy given? Holy Spirit existed. Peter even Spirit, says that the Holy Jesus Spirit wasn't given until until after Jesus Christ was resurrected. It was a gift from Christ. It was a Spirit comforter. Present in Genesis chapter one, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the Holy Spirit was involved in creation. And Peter so says Jesus in one Christ. of his epistles, Peter says in one of his epistles that Jesus preached by the Spirit to the prison. That's in prison. because Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Hmm? All right. So the Holy Spirit was back there. Wait, can we go to Psalm fifty-one, eleven, please? After Psalm. you answer my question, I want you to explain verse three to me. The, 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 I'm about to answer your question about the Holy Spirit first. Let me do that real quick. Sure. What is it? Psalm fifty-three. Fifty-three or fifty-one? Fifty-three. Oh, I'm sorry. Fifty-one. I'm sorry. Psalm 51, 11. I'm sorry. You're right. Okay. The first off, this is David talking. So that's that's pre-Christ, right? Pre-Christ incarnate. What does it say? Hold on, I gotta read it all. Okay. Yeah, it's say, right. yeah, you right. right. All right. So basically, when he said, uh, "I will send a comforter back," all the prophets of God had the Spirit of God, but regular people, sinners, they didn't have it then. Only the prophets did. Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. David was a prophet. Well, yeah, in a sense, but was Saul a prophet? Saul. Yeah, Saul, Saul had the spirit of God. He saw the spirit of God fell upon him, and he prophesied. Saul, the king that that David had tried to. Yes. It said the spirit. Of, it said the spirit of God fell upon him, and he prophesied. Sorry, yeah. Twice. Yeah. So that means that it came upon him, but did it stay on? Him? Well, no, okay. it didn't. Unfortunately. Right. Oh, I mean, you know, the spirit of God could fall on anybody if God send it, but now the spirit of God dwells within us as a comforter. The spirit of God dwelt in David. That's why he said, don't take it away from him because he was a prophet. Mm -hmm. All the prophets in the Old Testament had the spirit of God. That's what I'm understanding. But normal people didn't. They would, would receive it. Like you just said, Saul received it and was taken away and he received it again and was taken away. So here's a thought. Here's a thought. So the Holy Spirit was not given in its fullness and its power until the day of Pentecost. So that's, you know, that's, that's true. And I don't see how anybody can get around that. Um, there was something different at Pentecost. But Jesus did tell Nicodemus, that unless one is born of water and, and the spirit, spirit, they can't enter the kingdom of God true so people in the old testament who were saved would would have to be born of the spirit they would have to be converted in other words transformed through the power of the holy spirit even though the holy spirit had not been given in its fullness until the day of pentecost But that that's that's what pretty much what he was saying in uh Luke in Luke 18 when he said that the, the rich man was on the, the the torment side of hell and Abraham was on the paradise side of hell. It's pretty much the, it's saying the exact same thing. So they waiting, they waiting until the dead is raised up. 
Well, that's true. <clears throat> the dead are in the graves waiting the resurrection. But they're not dead. They're sleeping. Okay. I mean, and there'll be two resurrections, the resurrection of life and the resurrection of damnation. Exactly. Is if you die in Christ, you're not dead, but sleeping. If you die without, a, out of, without Christ, you were dead waiting on judgment day. For the second, for the second resurrection. Not the second, not the dead. The dead that's not in Christ, they're not waiting on the second resurrection. Yeah, Blessed is he that comes to the first resurrection, the second resurrection. Oh, uh, yeah, that's the one. You said the second resurrection had no, yeah. That's judgment day. Well, that, that kind of in a sense, but. It's the judgment day. It said the books were open and the dead, and they were judged. The judgment day. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And Jesus, when I said resurrection of life, resurrection of damnation, that's what Jesus said in the Gospel of John in chapter 5. So there are two resurrections. And one is the resurrection of damnation. So what are the Nephilim? Well, we do know from Genesis chapter 6 that there were giants back then. Right. Evolution teaches we're getting better and better and better. And then, no, we're scrawnier than we were when we were created. We're like pygmies compared to Adam. Um, <clears throat> And there were giants in Canaan. Um, you know, there is archaeological evidence that the um, that first generation, few generations, or whatever after the flood, that they they still retained some of that uh, giganticness, and um, they were technologically advanced. Um, evolution teaches that we're smarter today than. They were back then, but no, there's evidence to the contrary. It looks like it's Hebrew word 5303. Strong's Hebrew word, 5303. Wow. And it's translated giant three times in the Old Testament. Right, the Nephilim are the giants. So are they giants or are they good angels? The Nephilim are? Yeah. The Nephilim are, are the, the, the babies of the angels and the woman. Ah, oh, okay. And I think they're just the giants that um, existed back then because man was taller than we are, are today. So that word occurs once in Genesis 6, 4 and twice in Numbers 13, 33. Okay. And in the King James Version, all three instances, it's translated giant. Numbers 13, 33, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which can't come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Genesis 6, 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. Okay. Uh, when the Bible talks about the sons of God in several places um, of the Bible, it is referring to the lineage of Seth. David or um, Adam, and so yeah, that, that that's that's why I draw the conclusion that it, it wasn't angels. And then also when Jesus spoke and said that angels um, uh, that we um, in heaven um, were neither given in in, in were never given in marriage or or married, and you know God created us to only basically um, you know our babies in, 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 in marriage so but you but you just said though that it said that they was not given they were not given in marriage that don't mean that they that don't mean they didn't have a penis they don't mean that they couldn't have sex they just chose not to because god wouldn't allow them to why would god give them a sex organ that that, that, that they can't even use because they have to be pure we you are yeah. made in god's image you are yeah. made in god's image so the but exact that, same parts that God got, you have. So why would the angels be any different? I, I don't know if God has a reproduction organ. Because <laughs> God don't reproduce. Anything. God <laughs> made you in his image. Do you know what that means? Yeah, in a lot of ways, but because of the organs that we produce. I, 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 Jesus Christ had organs. That was God in the flesh. 
because he was in the flesh. He came as a human being, so he's going to have all the equipment that he's going to have. So you don't think, you thinking that once you go there, get your new body, new everything, because it never said that when, when he created Adam, Adam was, before he fell, he was just like Christ, just like God was. He was living, He as long as he ate the tree, he didn't die. He had everything. It didn't ever say they was having sex and brief pro crazy. Like he said, he said, fill the earth. Yeah, he did. Yeah. There's only way that there's only one way he would be able to do that. I did ask some Mormon missionaries once after they told me that God was Heavenly Father. You know, something just kind of clicked in my mind, and I said, Does God have a wife? And they said, Well, they don't have a dogma about that, but um, some people believe it. So I asked the, the one, Well, do you believe it? He said, Yes. And I asked the other, Do you believe it? And they, he said, yes. Well, they both believe it, even though it's not an official teaching. And I said, well, what's her name? Well, since they mistreated his son so bad, he's, he's, try, he's trying to protect his wife by not revealing her name. Um, I just don't think we should go down that road. Hey, man, it was a pleasure to meet you. You and, too, uh, brother. Honestly, I, I hope that you and I can keep a, some kind of dialogue on the side going, you know. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, the Lord is going to speak to the both of us. So, and some, I enjoyed some of the teachings that you guys taught. I mean, I know about it too. I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> you will, man. And so, yeah, uh, but you, yeah, look, look into the Protestant Reformation, man. It, a lot of that can, 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 can clue you in to a lot of the stuff that's going on today too, because everything that happened in history repeats itself. All right. All right. Yeah. Have a good Bye. one. God bless. Yeah, God for bless sure. you. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.